Aloha. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to a nation of immigrants. You can go to Japan, but you cannot become Japanese. You can go to China, but you cannot become a Chinese. You can go to Russia, but cannot become Russian. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to the United States and become an American. A Nation of Immigrants is a bi-weekly talk show featuring the life, achievement, diversity, and inclusion of some renowned immigrants. We invite first, second, or third generation immigrants to come to the show to share their life stories and the insights. Today, we have the honor to invite Greg Hu. Greg Hu is the CEO and the publisher of China Insight the only exclusive English language newspaper dedicated to promote cultural understanding between the United States and China. Greg grew up in Chicago and in 1991 started, in 2001 started China Insight, the newspaper. A few weeks ago, he just received Asian Pacific Leadership Award for his outstanding contribution to Asian Pacific Affairs. It is our great honor and pleasure to have Greg to be on the show. Welcome, Greg. Thank you for having me, Ken. Thank you, Greg. You, you, your life story is very inspiring. And you grew up in Chicago, one of my favorite cities in the world, and you settled in Minnesota. And I believe you have a very large part family. Could you please tell us about your family background and how okay. your ancestors moved to the United States, and uh, how you settled in Minnesota. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I want to clarify, I, not only was I born in uh, Chicago, I was born in actually Chicago's Chinatown, which is uh, one of the few Chinatowns right now that is growing versus other cities like New York and San Francisco and Boston and Washington, D.C. We have a what what I view as a very vibrant Chinese community, and uh, I was uh, I would transferred here back in uh, 1969, and back then I was wasn't sure whether or not I was comfortable leaving the uh, confines of uh, Chicago's Chinatown, but. I guess I can give you some background. Uh, I do come from a very, very large family. Uh, I'm number eight of 12 children. And what's very unusual with that too, uh, that was with uh, uh, one mother, whereas a lot of uh, men had more than one wife because of the Chinese Exclusion Act that mm. they came here and weren't able to go back and bring their family. So usually, um, socially, uh, they, they uh, uh, married again here in the United States. Uh, my dad uh, probably, uh, I look, finally found some uh, documents, uh, immigrated here um, uh, through uh, Seattle and um, back in 1910 and uh, tried to establish himself and, and make some money. and then went back uh, sometime in, uh, uh, I, I think it is in uh, uh, 1916, uh, and mm -hmm. then uh, brought my mother over. Now, what's very unusual about that too is um, because of the Exclusion Act and, and what have you, uh, Chinese uh, is one of the most difficult uh, cultures to uh, immigrate to the United States. And there were a lot of restrictions and they were really put through the third degree uh, as far as uh, uh, interviews. And uh, uh, the immigration office also established uh, Angel Island, which is off the uh, coast of uh, California, which was very un uh, unique. And I don't think it's ever been done for any other uh, ethnic group. So um, my dad was able to get here uh, because he was a merchant, so to speak. 
Mm. Because again, because of the Exclusion Act, it was very difficult for uh, peasants or, or uh, lower class people to immigrate. And most of the immigration that took place uh, in the early uh, 1860s and what have you uh, were working on railroads and uh, actually uh, became restaurateurs and, and uh, laundrymen to service the public because they couldn't get jobs. So uh, I actually moved to uh, Minnesota in 1969. Uh, I was hired by uh, uh, a very large uh, direct mail company, and um, my background was in advertising and sales promotion, which was very unique because uh, when I decided to go to college, uh, I, I kind of disappointed my dad because everybody assumes uh, your uh, Chinese are good mathematicians and scientists and musicians and what have you. But uh, I was an average student and uh, took, took history and, and political science, uh, which uh, actually uh, broadened my experience in a lot of different areas. So even though I grew up in Chicago and I uh, took typical jobs working in restaurants and waiters and bus boys, uh, I broke out of that uh, by going to college, and it was actually very unique that one of my uh, classmates was a, a young Irishman at Welsh, mm. and he was fascinated with Chinese, and he would always pin me down someplace and ask me to speak and say something Back then, the main language obviously was Cantonese. Mandarin hadn't broken through until after uh, mm -hmm. Nixon it really hit uh, and opened up uh, China. So uh, he would follow me around, and and uh, I did take some Chinese uh, school, but uh, I did it reluctantly to uh, satisfy my parents, but was not really a good student. So. Um, uh, I moved up here in 19, and there, and there were hardly any Chinese in the Twin Cities uh, mm. back in 1969. And uh, the Chinese food was uh, uh, a lot to be desired, but we, we persevered and, and have settled down. Um, one of the, uh, and, and I pretty quickly uh, determined that I wasn't a candidate for corporate America. So uh, I, I managed to uh, go into business for myself. Uh, I was a rep and I started a, a real estate company. I became a broker. And as a matter of fact, the, the name of my company that was uh, located in um, uh, Minnetonka was called Earth, Good Earth Realty after mm. the Pearl Buck uh, movie because it was earth and, and uh, land and all this other stuff. Yep. And when I did that, uh, I actually found uh, two Chinese guys approached me. One was a restaurateur and another one was uh, in real estate. And they said, hey, we'd like to have you start a real estate company for us. Mm -hmm. So I did that in actually 1979 and uh, ran it for about 25 years, uh, was a broker and, and said, but we naturally had a uh, tremendous recession uh, during that period after 1979, and it was pretty tough. But while I was doing that, uh, I, I broke out of my shell and uh, uh, discovered my Chinese-ness more than I had previously. And uh, that was uh, simultaneously with the uh, immersion of China uh, with, with uh, the visits by uh, you know, uh, Nixon and, and what have you. So while I was doing the, the real estate, uh, and, and that was about the only few uh, my partners and then I did meet some other restaurateurs like uh, Jack E and Lian Chin. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Rice Bowl was another restaurant that was very popular. 
so my wife and I also socially uh, started a tradition of hosting a Chinese New Year dinner I where I would, put the, I would put together a menu and wine and, uh, you know, I would reserve a restaurant. I started with maybe uh, 20 or 30 people, but when we decided it was enough, uh, we were up to over 200 people. And to this day, some of my friends would ask us, when are you going to have another Chinese New Year dinner and what have you? Yeah, so, may, I, may I quickly interrupt you, Greg? And I was very curious because you talk about Cantonese and Mandarin. What language you spoke at home when you grew up? It, it was what we would call Pidgin Cantonese Tuisan. Oh, Tuisan, uh, okay. Tuisan. Right, right. Tuisan, uh, okay. Because your family, also, your, your last name is Chu. That's Chu. Chu, that is in, 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 in Guangdong province, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and, and twice they're all around there because uh, the early immigrants came from what was then Canton. Canton, they, yeah. Yeah, and and, and you 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 born in Chinatown, and uh, you have very large Chinese American family. Were you have this very clear identity when you grew up that you were a Chinese American, and uh, you have a very so it appears that to me, and you have this Chinese New Year party. You're fond of Chinese food. You are you. I think you are very keenly aware. You are. You have you 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 have a very strong and long cultural tradition, and unlike the the uh, teenagers, teenager Chinese American these years, they they don't they don't feel that a strong connection uh, sure. to the cultural tradition. Right. I, yeah, I think that's attributed to the fact that I spent a, a lot of my youth in Chinatown, mm. and and was exposed. And not to reflect on today's uh, generations, uh, there was more of a, a cultural understanding, work ethic, and respect uh, that that was just eaten into us. Uh, that that that's the way we had to behave. Yeah, uh, but 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 Chinatown is still different from China. When was your last first visit to China? And when was your last visit to China? Well, uh, let's see. I made, uh, I believe, three trips uh, to China. Pretty much the first one was uh, typically as a tourist because I didn't know anything about it. Uh, and then another time uh, we went and, and did more sightseeing and and uh, went went to Hong Kong and Lantok Island and the monastery. And the most recent trip that I really enjoyed the most was uh, uh, 2019. I was able to uh, uh, get included on a official city delegation mm -hmm. to the sister city, Harbin and Minneapolis. Yeah. And my wife and I went there during their uh, uh, ice festival. Which was, I mean, St. Paul has an ice festival that this is about 20 times as extravagant mm -hmm. as what we saw. And the people were really nice and accommodating. So that, that was really a uh, eye-opening uh, experience. And uh, we, we would like to go back there again in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And because yeah, they have, it was uh, cool. they, yeah, they, they have yeah. a huge uh, uh, music festival. So that that would be uh, something that we we would look uh, to uh, 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 take advantage of. Now, uh, so that pretty much yeah. uh, with family. And matter of fact, uh, there's there's a, a, still seven seven siblings uh, living, and and uh, we're going to get together uh, shortly and and have a reunion. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things that uh, I, I attribute to when uh, getting involved with China Insight as a newspaper, uh, I was uh, uh, approached by uh, a, a couple of the founders early on, and they were looking for investors. Mm -hmm. And their business model 
uh, originally was to create a newsletter that would appeal to uh, business people that want to do business in China. And I thought, you know, everybody wants to be a China expert, you know, uh, 25 years ago. And, and uh, nobody's ever going to be. I, I think General Motors and uh, uh, Metronics, they're all trying to figure out how to do business in China. Uh, so I, I decided to try to serve the community in a more constructive way by being a bridge and promoting understanding between the U.S. and China. And right now, too, I, I think it's a really a challenge because uh, very previous uh, uh, administrations maybe, uh, you know, always tries to pick on the big guy and uh, don't have our, our acts together. So I, I want to try to uh, provide pro and con approaches to uh, what makes sense. Uh, because there, there are big differences between uh, the U.S. and, and uh, China relationships, but that's a tall order. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, we got to keep open mind, and uh, that's what I try to do with the China Insight. Uh, you know, trying to promote the culture. Uh, uh, right now, uh, there's a big project going on. We're trying to get a, a uh, China Garden going in uh, St. Paul, which is uh, sister city with uh, Changsha, and uh, um, I think that, that promotes better understanding. So uh, if, if you were a, a military guy, the best thing to do is you really, you got to study your, you got to know your enemy you know, and, and deal with them and, and compromise. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, seeking to try to establish that. But also, uh, I, I feel the uh, uh, Chinese and, and uh, uh, Pacific Island communities uh, need to work more together, you know, to to uh, become uh, more mainstream and and uh, uh, work together to solve some of these problems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that's kind of my my uh, goal. Yeah, right thank, now. thank thank you very much. That's exactly the question that I wanted to ask you. And uh, congratulations again for your outstanding achievement award on the Asian Pacific Leadership Award. And it was very good to see you, and the governor and uh, the U.S. Senator, and so many 600 people showed up at your award ceremony. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. And obviously, the, the, your contribution to the community is, is so vital. And the Chinese Insight for so many years remains the only English language newspaper about China affairs. And so they are, because chi immigrants, particularly the first generation immigrants, they tend to live in their own silos. They live in their you know, little world, they speak their mother tongue, they never get out and have very isolated from the, the larger community. And, but your, your uh, provided this platform, China Insight, to build the connections between the Chinese community and other Asian Pacific uh, Minnesotan community, as well as the United States and China. So I, I truly admire your contribution. And you brought up that you want to be Chinese to be more visible. Now the question I have for you is, uh -huh. and uh, what, what do you see the future and for Asian um, uh, Chinese Americans and or Asian Americans at large in the American society, was that how different that will be from 1960s and to maybe the next 20 or 30 years? Uh, boy, if, if I had the, the, the answer to that, uh, I, I would, I'd be someplace uh, drinking pina coladas and what <laughs> have you. I, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, um, factors that uh, are, are going to have to change I mean, we, we could talk about uh, threats of uh, devaluation of the dollar and, and whether or not the yuan will become uh, international uh, currency. Uh, I, I, I felt early on when there appeared to be uh, envy of China be, becoming such an economic powerhouse that 
they, they were uh, being accused of making cheap goods. But we went through that uh, in, in a couple of cycles way back when I was growing up. When Japan was making up all the cheap uh, toys and everything. And then it, it went to Mexico and, and to Vietnam. And as far as most people, if they understand, you know, China wasn't making cheap goods because they wanted to. It's because Americans or the consumers wanted the best product they can as cheaply as they can. And depending on the transition now that uh, uh, China is is uh, drifting more towards uh, uh, more uh, high quality products, uh, they are already shifting to other continents for cheap labor. So China, you know, China can sh shoot itself in the foot because they could be a victim of their own success. Uh, and and some of the other things that people uh, got to be careful about accusations about human rights uh, uh, activity and how bad are they and and uh, is the does the end justify the means? So it, it gets into a lot of moral and and philosophical uh, uh, things that uh, we would have to see. But I I think. You know, this is a a, a big universe. I, I think there there is opportunity for major powers to uh, coexist, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether or not uh, there there would be concern that uh, China would be dragged into uh, a war with Taiwan, and the U.S. is uh, stuck with uh, the, the, a commitment that maybe have been made. Uh, we have to be careful about how that is going to transpire. Mm -hmm. So one, one of the concerns I have and, and encourage is for uh, uh, Chinese and Asian communities to get involved in politics and get into the grassroots level. And not wait until it's too late, because once the, once they start sending missiles, it's it's all over, you know. Yeah. So, I, I, so... <laughs> I, I I I cannot agree with you more. But I appreciate your optimism. You know, it's uh, overall you're op very optimistic. Now I am a much more a pessimistic guy. You know, I do, uh, I I feel that you know the subtitle of our show today is "Be in Harmony uh, Yet Different." It'd be different. That's from Confucius. Oh. That means that we are uh, uh, in this together, but uh, uh, still have a, a distinct uh, cultural identity. But uh, the, the problem I see that your generation and my generation, we still have this fight. We speak the language, we read the literature, we watch the movie, we eat the food. But uh, for younger generation, I'm not entirely sure you know, they still have a, a, a cultural connection or mentally or physically uh, with uh, another culture. So anyway, we are uh, have a few minutes left, but I do want to ask you this very important question. We ask all our distinguished guests. And uh, uh, you are a little bit older than me, and but I was wondering that if you time travel permitted, you were able to travel back to your 20s and meet yourself in your 20s, what advice you want to give you your uh, younger me and uh, with all the knowledge and experience you have today? Uh, you, you know, one thing I, I, I attribute a lot of things to and, and advise, you know, my children, my grandkids and what have you is, Get involved. You're going to make mistakes, but you don't want to have any regrets that you could have, you should have. Uh, be aware of what's going on. Ask questions. Um, get the facts, and act on that. I mean, you know, uh, in my business career and and socially, uh, you know, you only learn by mistakes. Uh, you know, because uh, anybody that doesn't 
admit to having made any mistakes. Uh, I don't have much confidence in, in anything else they're going to tell me. So um, uh, get, get involved, uh, participate in whatever makes you comfortable, uh, whether it be social, political, philanthropy. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, are starting to gear up a little bit more in the area of uh, gifting and, and, you know, to uh, help other organizations achieve different things. Um, actually, during the uh, award ceremony, the big thing was uh, uh, the COVID uh, response, what the community, the Asian community did from all the fundraising and, and um, even the business people, uh, the Chinese chambers uh, uh, got involved with that. Uh, a little less serving uh, for each other should be taken down. And I think the community should be, uh, uh, how is it gonna affect our community and our life uh, and our kids uh, needs to be put in the forefront rather than be the tendency for a lot of uh, individuals that are trying to better themselves to uh, be self-serving. So mm -hmm. that that's that's one of the biggest things I would like to see change uh, within some of the Asian communities. Thank you very much, Greg. Good advice and good comments. Thank you for your time, Greg. It's our great pleasure to interview you and to be on our show. And today we have Greg Yu, CEO and publisher of China Insight, recipient of Asian Pacific Leadership Award for his outstanding contribution to Asian American affairs. Thank you again, Greg, to be on the show. And I look forward to you reading your next issue of China Insight. <laughs> and I, I wish you a very uh, happy week. And look well, forward to reconnect. For, thank you for those kind words. Good luck. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.